Hello everyone, I'm Ron Waxman from Washington and we are here at PCR with uh, Michael Haude and Clemens Ford Wittbergen. We're going to discuss today about the magnesium scaffold, the BRS magnesium scaffold, and maybe I'll start with you, Michael. Tell us what is the difference between the magnesium scaffold versus the polymeric scaffold that are uh, available? Well, thanks for bringing up this question. Actually, the uh, fully bioresorbable magnesium scaffold is made out of a uh, metal alloy. And this is really something which is differentiating from the PLLA-based versions. It has different mechanical properties with respect to radial strength, with respect to tensile strength. It has a significantly, in its current version, shorter absorption time. It is one year. And it's by this much more practically to be used because it can be electro-polished. It has much rounder strut shapes that allows to have a much better trackability to the vessel. And the strut thickness, is there any strut difference between the two? thickness is 150 micrometer, very similar to the two CE marked PLLA based fully bioresorbable scaffolds. Excellent. And Clemens, uh, there is some clinical data already that is available. Uh, right. Can you summarize uh, what is the main points of the clinical data okay. so far? At EuroPCR we have seen the 12 month results of the uh, Biosoft uh, 2 trial um, with a mandatory uh, clinical follow up and angiographic follow-up that was performed in, roughly speaking, one out of three patients. Um, the clinical uh, results were uh, very encouraging. Uh, we've seen a, a low target lesion failure rate that is similar to what we have seen in uh, BVS trials. And um, uh, we've seen angiographic uh, data that showed a stability of the late lumen loss, uh, both in segment and in scaffold. You know that the uh, scaffold thrombosis was a big issue initially with uh, right. the polymeric uh, approach they uh, absorb. Uh, what is the status of uh, the scaffold thrombosis with the magnesium so far? So far we have not seen any uh, uh, scaffold thrombosis during the uh, 12 months uh, from implantation in the Biosoft 2 trial. Excellent. And um, you know when we're coming to the whole BRS technology, Michael, there are a lot of technical aspects that needs to be implemented. I'm sure some of them are also applicable to the magnesium. So can you kind of summarize what are the main aspects from the technical aspects that the physician needs to do when he's going to have this product in his hands? I think uh, with like other fully bioresorbable technology, lesion preparation is extremely important. Has to be done as good as possible. There's probably the stepwise approach, first starting with a non-compliant balloon, if not good enough, going to a scoring device. So there has to be an adequate opening. There should be a residual stenosis less than 20% and at least a lumen of 2.5 millimeter that you have achieved. Second, vessel sizing is very important to accommodate the available sizes. When the device becomes CE marked and goes to the market, we will have 3.0 and 3.5 vessels, so we should not implant beyond 2.75 millimeter. That is very important. And what is important, if you use imaging, which I really recommend during the learning phase of that, you should size the vessel according to this. If you have imaging technology on the shelf, um, use it to document your implant result. If you don't have it, if you go for a purely angio-driven and guided scenario, you should always post-dilate the device with a non-compliant balloon, at least with a one-to-one -one ratio to the implant balloon size, sometimes a quarter size or half a millimeter larger. Michael, one question about the imaging you mentioned. Any preference OCT versus IVOS for this technology that you would recommend? them? If you want to have just lumen size, uh, the, the OCT probably is the best you have. If you would get more information about plaque composition in order just to guide your preparation of the lesion, IVUS is very helpful. IVUS can be also adequately used uh, after implantation to properly document a well-implanted scaffold. And with respect to post dilation, is that mandatory to everyone or you don't need to do it in every no, uh, okay. uh, as, I, as I mentioned, I recommend it to be mandatory if we don't have an intravascular imaging post-implantation. Um, if the OCT or IVUS shows us an adequate implantation result, um, then we don't need to post-dilate it. But since if we don't have this data or this information available, just purely angio-guided, I strongly recommend to post-dilate with a non-compliant balloon. So my last question, gentlemen, would be to patient selection and how do you start the program with the magnesium BRS once it's approved? And maybe I'll start with you, Clemens. How would you choose your patients that would be suitable for this uh, technology? I think it's important to choose uh, um, lesions that are accessible in, in relatively large, uh, more proximal uh, coronary segments. 
and uh, it's important that you can pre-dilate them well, uh, uh, that, that you can uh, safely uh, implant uh, the magnesium uh, scaffold uh, with a nice result. On the other hand, you should not forget um, who, who is going to benefit from uh, such, a, such a device. So younger people will benefit more. In addition, um, a stiff calcified vessel will not show um, uh, restoration of uh, vasoreactivity uh, uh, reactivity and um, therefore younger um, patients and uh, um, mildly or non-calcified uh, lesions are certainly to be selected in the very beginning. Anything to add, Michael, in terms of patient selection, lesion yeah, selection? I would, I would agree with, with Clemens. Actually, I can say where I won't use it. I won't use it in CTO because restoration of vessel motion is, is probably not available. I won't use, use it in two complex uh, bifurcation scenarios where two scaffold strategies would be necessary. Absolutely not to be used currently in left main disease because the available sizes are not accommodating this and I clearly will not use it in scenarios where uh, acute coronary syndrome thrombus plays a significant role. And of course we, we should be for sure that the patient is uh, taking the dual antiplatelet therapy for at least six months, which is recommended for this device. So six months would be the minimum of uh, the APT? Correct? So the recommendation is coming from the trials. There the recommendation was to take it at least six months. So I think the only thing we can do is translate this into our clinical practice. Excellent. So I think uh, this is a very good introduction to a product that is going to come hopefully soon into the market. And I think what we probably heard today is, first of all, the first um, understanding the features are different. This is a metallic BRS, it's a little bit different than the polymeric and I think uh, Michael uh, outlined very nicely the differences. We also uh, learned that the clinical data, although not robust, but it's a very promising, it's a very uh, intriguing and uh, probably would be the base to get the CE mark and obviously there will be more data that will be accumulated over time uh, with post-marketing studies and with other studies. Uh, we are focused a lot about the features of the technicalities which are really, really important and also patient selection and how to start the program. Obviously we want to have a very careful launch of the product so we can utilize it and learn together how we expand the utilization of the magnesium barisorbable scaffold for our patients in the future. Thank you very much gentlemen. Thank you. I learned Thank you. a lot.